dealing with uh, Beverly Fish, who has a long family history of uh, studying the women's suffrage and women's events in Michigan. She's all the way from Ypsilanti. This is her second appearance here. She was here last year. Beverly Fish. Hi. Wow. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it's like, can you hear me if I don't have a mic? Because I don't have a mic on, but you can hear me? OK, if you can hear me in the far back, then you're OK. I'm used to teaching, so I have a teacher voice, and I can do that. Um, so I'm going to talk about how Michigan played a really prominent role in the national uh, work that they did for women's suffrage. To get the right for women to get the right to vote was a long, long fought out battle. And so it took a couple of generations of women. The women who started the battle didn't wind up getting to vote because by the time the vote came in 1920, uh, those people had passed on. But they had a second generation that took over. And in Michigan, that was true, as in the national level. There were people who worked tirelessly from the very beginning when our state was in 1837 when the state was founded it wasn't that long after in 1846 actually that a woman came from New York she was Ernestine Rose and she came she was traveling all over the country speaking about women's rights and that was before they even had a women's rights conference she was like way ahead of that by a couple years and she came to Michigan and she spoke to the state legislature and said when you're starting your state up, you know, you've, you're just going now. You can, you can add that. You can, you can be one of the first areas to, for state, actually, to have women the right to vote if you did that. But they didn't. It had no impact at all. She talked. It was nice. The letter, like, thank you for your time, kind of thing. But in 1848, in New York, you might know about Seneca Falls. You've heard about Seneca Falls, the big women's rights conference. Well, that was where I kind of started my quest Actually, Sojourner Truth got me to all of this. And it was because of her. So I'm really happy to be in Battle Creek always because that's like where she uh, kind of made her first real home outside of Massachusetts. She did have a house there. But she actually, her first real long-term home, and she died here. So we claim her as a Michigan woman. And we put her in the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame because of that, too. So, And I was in Minnesota, and I heard about her. And somebody had named a battered woman shelter the Sojourner Truth Shelter, and I asked why, and they said, oh, they weren't really sure she was an abolitionist or like some, they, they weren't really sure who she was. And I thought, well, I'm going to find out. So I started my quest to trying to find books, and in those days, and this is a, before women's studies really took off, uh, there were very few women written about, there were few biographies, they weren't in history books. If you remember your history book, you had maybe Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and a few people. And they did mention uh, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, working for the right to get women's right to vote. And if you saw that one little chapter or one little paragraph, you might think that was easy. They just said, let's get the right to vote, and 150 years later, bam, they get it. Well, it wasn't really that easy, and 150 years is a long time. So even, well, even longer, really. So. Um, it's been a long time since 1848 when they finally got uh, things going, but that was the first year that a few women got together and decided they wanted to talk about women's rights, and they went to Seneca Falls. And I knew that my, and I was doing this research on Sojourner of Truth, and I knew that my relatives came from that same area, Rochester, New York, that same area. The Finger Lakes, right, are, lakes are right behind high or kind of down below, like before the uh, Rochester area. So it's, a, it's an area that I knew that, you know, I could find probably research on my relatives and do research on Sojourner Truth because she had not been at that convention, but I knew they had papers where she had been in that area. She had visited a lot of people because Susan B. Anthony later had a home there in Rochester, New York. So I knew that she'd come there a lot. So I thought, and they told me there were papers there, although I found everything I really needed here in Battle Creek. But I went there, it was fun. Uh, so I, and I thought, I'll look up my family. And it was interesting, because I didn't know. I had been to Seneca Falls, as, and they had a museum there, and I'd, I'd got the Declaration of Sentiments that they had um, signed, all the women had signed that day, and a few men uh, had come to see what the women were up about you know they wanted to see what was going on here so men came too uh, with their wives and they met at that church and they talked about women's issues and they all said yeah 
legally, there is no reason in this country that we don't have women and men legally le at least treated equal, like for rules and laws, and they should not be considered uh, incompetent, <laughs> that they were the same as men um, uh, legally and mentally. And they should have equal rights, except for one. And that was the voting issue, and that was the last one they brought up. And people didn't think that was kind of like too far. Mm, women shouldn't get in politics. Like, okay, everything else is okay, but politics, no. So that was debated a lot, and, and they finally decided to let it pass, but it wasn't unanimous. Everything else was unanimous, and that one was kind of not sure about, but they, they finally put it on there. And that became the one issue that, that really got the steam and momentum that people went on to fight with. And I, when I read about my family papers, it came to me that Catherine F. Stebbins, a woman who wrote, who signed the, the Declaration, actually helped, helped write it too. Uh, she was involved, very involved in that movement, was the secretary of the committee and really involved. And her middle name, Fish, the F stood for Fish, was my family name. And I found her records and I found out that she was actually the sister of my ancestor. So she was a great, great, great aunt. And I thought, that's so fascinating that it came and made it really personal that, wow, Sergeant of Truth, she knew Sergeant of Truth. Her, Later on, it would be years later before I found a book at U of M. By accident, I happened to find a book, and it showed it was a book about that was written by her husband Giles Stebbins, about her and her life and all their political activities. They were big abolitionists. They were then very women's rights activists, um, very involved people. And he wrote this book about it's a biography, and he talked about how he was the best friend of Sojourner of Truth. And I thought, how did I miss that? Because I'd already written about Sojourner, already published stuff about her by that time. And then I found this book and thought, I never put that together. And it talked about how they both came to Harmonia and lived for a while. And then they moved to, Catherine and her husband moved to Detroit. And they would be really big in the movement in Detroit. But they actually knew her and I thought that's such a coincidence that my family no wonder I wanted to know about her she was like in a, so it was like so sometimes these things are just really serendipitous and it was really nice so that started my really quest to be a woman's historian I wanted to write women into history I wanted to find out more about all women I mean I started going and doing a lot of research about lots of women and, and I got very involved into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame I got on their board in the early 80s so I'd been on the board for a long time, and I helped induct a lot of women. We have to still get Catherine Fish Stebbins into the Hall of Fame. She's the only woman that I'm going to speak of today that's not in the Hall of Fame yet. And that's because I never put her in because I didn't know for a long time that she moved to Detroit. I thought she stayed in Rochester area until I found, even when I found those papers, it didn't indicate that she'd moved. And I didn't know that till way later that she'd actually come to Michigan. And I could claim her now because she was, even though she was born and raised in New York and did most of her activities there for a long time, she finally came here during the big, uh, big uh, suffrage campaign. So by the time they were really getting into the suffrage campaign, she was here. Um, she started out then in New York, came here, and uh, was very, very active in the campaign like Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth, people really didn't realize, they thought she was just an abolitionist. She spoke about abolition. Uh, she spoke about slavery, because that was what people were speaking about then. Women were just getting accepted, barely, as speakers on that movement, because they shouldn't be doing political stuff. But they would kind of talk about how it was just something they had to talk about because it was a woman's issue too because women were being slaves and they were being mistreated and it, it was something that women had to get involved in so they got their feet wet in politics through abolition most of the women early women in the suffrage movement actually had started out like my uh, ancestor Catherine Fish Stebbins as an abolitionist like they really got started that way and then when they said wait a minute women aren't equal either we know we're working for African-American men to get the right to vote. But what about African American women and all women? So they decided to go into that camp that they would work on universal suffrage. Everybody having the right to vote. And actually in 1849, a year after Seneca Falls, there was a senator, a state senator, Rix Robinson, and he actually proposed that. He proposed a universal suffrage bill in Lansing. That was pretty unique because in those days, nobody talked about that. 
Michigan was actually very progressive. They had all these New Yorkers coming that had moved here that were very progressive abolitionists, very progressive people, at, and uh, they had come here. And so this state actually was very outspoken, very in the leadership role of most issues. It kind of hard to believe, but we were. Um, and so even though people thought, oh, it's kind of like a needless thing, we don't really want to, it's kind of, no one else is doing that now. Universal suffrage is kind of too, we can't really do that. It's like too far out there. <laughs> they couldn't follow it, but, but he proposed it. And that was the first time after Ernestine Rose had spoken about women's rights, we had a proposal. Then in 1852, a few few years later, um, or 1855, I think that's when they, they started petitioning. Women were getting together, now that uh, they were in abolition societies, and another thing that happened, and actually right in Kalamazoo here, Lucinda um, Hinsdale Stone actually proposed that women start clubs. Women should have you know, something they can get together. Maybe they shouldn't be political activists, but under the radar they could be clubs. So why don't they have clubs where women could come and they could speak like literary societies, they could read books, kind of like a book club today. They could meet up, they could get out of their houses for a while, they could meet and have coffee and tea, and they could do this. And so that would be something, but then they could talk politics too. But that would be something that would be non-threatening to the men. They would just say, oh, it's just my women's club. So that's how they started. And she proposed that they have the Ladies Literary Club in Kalamazoo. And that actually was the first women's club, but it grew. They heard about that in other cities and thought, we should have one. And pretty soon they're all over the country, actually. And that was something that was really important to Michigan politics because the women used that as a place that they could come and be non-threatening and talk about women's right to vote and women's right to have legal equity too. Because at that time women didn't own their own wages, they didn't own their children. I mean legally they didn't have any, they were kind of guardians of their father and then guardians of their husband. Only women who didn't marry and kind of were single or sort of in kind of in a limbo land. They didn't really, they weren't like covered by anybody. But still a lot of times like women would lose their house or farms because um, they didn't own them. The, fa the husband it went to the son or it, you know, just, or they had to have a legal guardian. Uh, a male. So they were proposing that changes in that. New York started changing after the Women's Rights Conference in 1848. New York just passed all kinds of equality laws. But then so did Michigan. Michigan said that's true. They should have legal, legal rights. And they started gradually passing laws to make them more uh, equitable. But they still weren't sure about that suffrage thing. Voting, mm, women shouldn't really be in politics. So places like different counties, like Linaway County was one of the first counties to have their women's group start to send petitions up to Lansing asking that women have the right to vote. And then other little literary clubs started doing that too. So they started getting momentum because women were coming together talking about this issue. Why is it that they can't vote? We pay taxes too. And now that we are getting more equality under the law in Michigan, they wanted more rights. So they were a lot of petitions, but no action was happening. And then the Civil War comes, 1861 to 65, of course, and things kind of stop, take a back seat. Uh, people are working for, um, you know, during the war, doing all kinds of help during the war, background things, and they, they stop pushing for that. But then after the war, the thing happens that, well, we should give African men the right to vote. Now, Frederick Douglass is very supportive of women getting the right to vote, too, he says, but if we can take the right without you guys, if we can get the amendment passed, um, the 15th Amendment to give us the right to vote, we're going to take it because we've got to get it when they're ready to give it to us because otherwise we're not going to get that. So they do pass that, but that makes a lot of people like Sergeant of Truth and other women saying, wait a minute, you gave the men the right but not us. Why is that? Um, so that would get a lot of other women together and start to discuss that. And why are women still not given right to vote? And people would say, well, you know, there are, it's, why not? Because there are a lot of people that we don't give the right to vote for. We don't give it to children. We don't give it to mental patients. We don't give it to criminals. So there's other classes of people. You're not the only class. And we thought, wait a minute, <laughs> why are you lumping us with that? I mean, why are you treating us that way? So women really started to work in these little clubs and started to put pressure because again they're not in the legislature they're not elected officials they how can they give any 
any input except by their husbands, their sons, their fathers. Um, so the first bill, 1866, for women's suffrage um, was the first one introduced in, in the legislature in Lansing. It was defeated by one vote. It came that close. They almost, in 1866, were the first state to have the right to vote. So it's amazing that we don't, we forgot about our history, that we have a lot of strong women here that are very influential. Well, they didn't take, you know, they didn't stop. They said, okay, we lost that one. We're going to keep going. Um, there are a lot of women who decided that what we really need to do is really put the pressure on, then let's say kind of lower it down. And that was a pretty smart thing to do. Um, there are two women, like Emily Burton Ketchum. And Emily Burton Ketchum was from Grand Rapids. And she was Mary Doe and May Stocking Nags were very instrumental about trying to work now on a different campaign. Let's work for the women at least to get the right to vote in school boards. Because if we can get women to get the right to vote in a school board election, that's a foot in the door. And they did that. And eventually, in 1867, one year later, they got that right. So they thought that's a, that's a really a good sign that we can probably keep working on this and we can eventually get total suffrage. They threw a total suffrage bill out there, and it was defeated by just three votes, 31 to 34. So they were close. I mean, they knew that they weren't that far off. Um, so they, in 1870, they formed the Michigan Suffrage Association that would be kind of like the National Suffrage Association. The, the problem with the National Suffrage Association, it, it was divided. There were people that said we should still work like Susan B. Anthony and Stanton said, we need to have a uh, federal amendment to the Constitution because otherwise, yes, so New York can vote and maybe you can vote in other states, but we'll never get all the states. And actually, it was kind of interesting that the first states that we do get women the right to vote in are Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Washington, and California. None of the traditional beginning states did that, but the states, as they came into the Union from the West, said, well, we took women to get these states going. It took women pioneers to get out there, to help with the men, to establish a state. So when they wrote their constitutions and came into the Union, they put women right to vote in their constitution. Now, that meant they couldn't vote for federal, but they could vote for all the state elections, and that's what Michigan started to, to work on that. Other states have this now. We're not going to be the first. So we kept working on that, the total suffrage, everybody get the right to vote. So they've, they worked on that for a long time, Emily Ketchum and uh, May Stocking Nags. It was interesting that when May Stocking Nags took on, she was from uh, Bay City, and she traveled all over the place with sort uh, not, uh, with Susan B. Anthony. When Susan B. Anthony started going around the country talking about we have to have a federal amendment. Forget, like, it would be great if Michigan passed it and we got that, but let's not just go there. We need a federal. We want all states to have equality. So she went on a national tour with her all over the place, and her four children stayed home with her husband, and he was very supportive. That was, like, amazing at that time. This is the, you know, 1800s. And he said, fine, we, I'll, I'll stay home. You go off and, and do this. Uh, and she was so, she did one year, she did 60 speeches with by herself and with Susan B. Anthony. And that's like, the only person I know was equal to that was Sojourner Truth that spoke all the time. Um, so she was out there, she was president of the Michigan Equal Suffrage Association for a few years. Uh, she was just so busy. And eventually, because of her actions and because women could vote now in the school board, she got elected to the Bay City Board of Education. And that's amazing. Women started getting elected to these spots. That was the first elected officials what were school boards. And now we might think that's, you know, women are always on school boards. But this is the 1800s when that wasn't considered very traditional. We had uh, other women at that time. Well, uh, Ketchum, of course, was uh, very involved in Grand Rapids, but she started touring the state too. She was a friend of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, she went to their conferences, and eventually she, in, she invited their conference to come to Grand Rapids. They had their national conference in Grand Rapids on women's rights and the right to vote. And she actually, Ketchum, spoke at the Chicago World's Fair in 18, um, 
93, they had this big Chicago World's Fair, and it was attended by a lot of people, and they had a woman's building. That was the first time they had a building set aside for women to come and speak, and they'd speak on women's issues. Like, you know, sanitation. Women were really big. If you uh, study women's history, you'll see that they get the first people that are really involved in getting sanitation, clean water. You know, women have always been like, we got to make sure that there's, um, you know, health clinics, things like that. They were really involved in that. So they spoke on those issues, but she spoke on suffrage and it was well attended. People are saying, yeah, you, you, um, you really have to get on the national board and, and speak because um, we, we really need your help. But we had another woman from Michigan who was on the national board who was elected. It was Anna Howard Shaw. Maybe you've heard of her. She was raised in Big Rapids. So we count her, even though she left Michigan and became a minister and, um, and, and wound up in other areas, but she wound up in Washington, D.C. eventually and became the president of the National Women's Studies, I mean, National Suffrage Association. And she was tireless again in her energy. We have so many women who did so much and spoke so so often and did so much leadership roles. Clara Arthur from Detroit was another woman who joined with my ancestor, Catherine Fish Stebbins, to really work on the Michigan Suffrage Association. Um, they tried very hard to get it on the ballot. Uh, in they, they actually had the first senator from Michigan, uh, Thomas, or the, the first speaker about women's suffrage, was a U.S. Senator from Michigan, Thomas Palmer. And he, no one had actually, they, they brought the issue up and should we pass the, you know, talk about women's suffrage and it didn't go anywhere. But he got up and finally in 1884 and, and had an address to the Congress about suffrage and it's time to do this. And we, and we could see by in the 80s, by 1880s, more push was being put on the state and the national to work on the suffrage issue. But in back in Michigan, what they decided to do, Arthur, Clara Arthur had kind of taken over from Ketchum by that time, and she had become the president of the group, and she was pushing for at least letting women vote in municipal suffrage. Now we have the school board, now let's vote for our local people because, you know, city councils are really important. They're the ones that do all the local issues and kind of work with things that are very community organized and women that's still okay like they try to talk about how that's not as political so give us that right to at least do that and you know once you get the right to vote then you can start running for these places uh, we can see women mayors and women city council people so in 1893 they really pushed that and they got a municipal suffrage passed but the supreme court said it was unconstitutional because it created a new class of voters, and you can't do that. Well, that's like, where did they come up with that? So the, Anna Howard Shaw and, and all the, you know, the women rallied up for the, at the Constitutional Convention. They were going to rewrite the Constitution in 1907, so they geared up for that. They said, you know, when they have this Constitutional Convention, they're going to rewrite the Constitution. That's what we can do. Let's make sure they put, let's just go for, again, let's forget the municipal which they're actually eventually going to get. But let's write at this time, just go for, let's go for the complete, like, suffrage. And it was defeated 38 to 57, so it didn't go. But they did decide that women, that because they kept saying, didn't we get founded on, you know, again, on the national slogan was uh, that no representation, you know, but if you have taxation without representation, that's not really legal. And aren't we paying taxes? And a lot of women did pay taxes. So they said, well, if a woman can prove that she's paying taxes, say she owns a house and she pays taxes, then she can vote on any bond or tax issue. So that was kind of a little, we, they lost the, the big one, but they, they gained a little. And they kept gaining little by little. And things by that time, by the turn of the century, it was getting more momentum. They still were looked at as being a little bit radical. The average woman still would say, I'm not sure about that. Um, it wasn't like a groundswell movement yet, but it was getting more. It was progressing a little more. And even the governor uh, of Michigan, Charles Osborne, actually urged them to put 
the question in front of the voters, and he wanted them, you know, what's the harm of having it as a, uh, putting it in front of the voters, see what the voters want in November, um, and see if we can get that through. So in 1912, he has a, um, a, a referendum on the ballot, but it doesn't succeed. We think it wins, like this is a real, you go back and read the papers and it seems like it wins, but then it doesn't. Votes disappear. It's really one of the first mysterious circumstances. It says, under mysterious circumstances, some of the votes got changed and it doesn't win. So that, beca that was really interesting. The women start investigating that and they find that there is a big group in Michigan against the right of women to vote. Now if you think about it, who in Michigan would really be opposed to that? I mean, why would, what industry would have a lot of money and really worry because there is a new group out there, the Women's Christian Temperance League. And they are really, and you remember Carrie Nation going up and, and actually up here in Holly, she smashed a saloon. The, the men are really worried in Lansing that if we get women the right to vote, you know what's going to happen. They're going to vote uh, prohibition. We're going to outlaw alcohol. So that was how they scared a lot of people away. And they had a lot of money. In Michigan, there's lots of brewers, and they have a lot of money. And they put money behind this group. And they actually, and by 1913, and, and that's, what, that's what they suspect, how somehow m money was exchanged, something happened. And, and remember, we have just paper ballots then, and they're not really very uh, private. <laughs> you kind of sometimes even have open you know, ballot stuff things. And there was a lot of ballot stuffing and a lot of crazy things. And as the papers say, mysterious circumstances occurred. And what seemed to be a win, all of a sudden, something disappeared. Boats got lost, and they appear again, and they're different. Uh, they think it was the alcohol. Uh, they never proved it, but they said, you know, we think it's the alcohol people that are behind this. So the Michigan Association opposed to equal suffrage formed in that time, too, because they became very outspoken. They started passing leaflets around by why women did not need the right to vote. They were very, very outspoken about um, that women, you know, were not qualified to do this. So then the women came up with their own leaflets and pamphlets. They had all kinds of leaflets. That was one of the big things. You think that leafleting is a big, because they didn't have social media, so they had to do paper stuff. They said women are citizens. They passed out flyers and, and they want to do their civic duty and that there are more working women now than ever before. They talked about how things had changed from the early days. In the early days, you know, maybe you could say that women didn't go to school. They weren't admitted to public grammar schools. Women were not admitted to colleges. Women were not admitted to the trades and professions. Married women could not own property. Married women did not own their own children. I mean, their, you know, their own money. They, they didn't have any legal rights. But they're saying things have changed. Now, in the 1900s, we enter a new era. Those early people who fought so hard for the suffrage movement have passed on. It's a new generation, and these women are going to really try much harder. They're going to campaign stronger. The other women were pretty still ladylike. They would come into Congress and they would ask you know, right to vote and they would kind of pat them on the head and say, okay, that's fine. We, we'll think about it kind of thing. But these women were more fired up and they're going to get totally fired up when Alice Paul comes on the scene. But they're leafleting, they're petitioning. Pretty soon they're going to be parading. They're going to be at every, every little county fair. They're going to set up a table they're going to set up booths. They're going to start talking to people. They're getting petitions, and especially Michigan. Michigan is very big on that. So um, they're saying that our high schools are graduating more girls than boys now. 40,000 women are in our colleges. Uh, there's 8 million wo women working in trades and professions. Married women can own property now. 16 states, married women are equal guardians of the children. Only 16, but it's getting better. Mental competence of women is now recognized in all phases of social responsibility except franchise. The time has come to change the political status of women and make it in accord with her present social, economic, and intellectual status. So they talked about how also, again, in Norway, Australia, New Zealand, and Finland, women could vote. Why not in our country? Um, and municipal elections, England, Scotland, Ireland, Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, Can in, and the state of Kansas now has municipal elections. So eventually Michigan does let them vote in municipal elections, and they keep going. I mean, they're just sure that they're, they can just keep pushing on 
and it'll eventually pass. So we have people like um, the, another woman who I have to mention, Olympia Brown. Olympia Brown came from Kalamazoo, uh, and she was the first woman ordained minister with full like rights. Like there were some women preaching, but she had full ecclesiastical rights, and she was ordained and recognized. And she actually had a congregation. Her first congregation was in Massachusetts. Then she moves to Racine, Wisconsin. But she was from Michigan, so we always claim her here because she was raised here. We thought that maybe gave her the, the spunk that she needed because she was a Michigan woman. And she decided that in 1886, just before you know, people are really pushing and going, and she's getting, a, by that time, um, she's an older woman, but she doesn't give up. You know, she's like a grandmother, and she decides, you know, people are saying, you should go home now and let the younger women do it, and she didn't. She just kept on. She just um, continued to press for the right to vote. She quit the ministry, retired, and went full-time into working for the national right to vote. She actually went to D.C., and by 1916, she was on the National Advisory Council for the Women's Party because Alice Paul had arrived, and Alice Paul said, we need to chain ourselves to the White House gate. We need to picket the White House. We need to picket President Wilson. We need to burn his speeches because the war was going on, you know, over in Europe. And he kept saying, we're fighting a war for democracy over in Germany and Europe. And they said, well, we don't have democracy here. We can't vote. So they really started burning his speeches across in Lafayette Park every day. And they'd have special days when uh, a certain state had to come and you'd be in charge of picketing and, and the White House and be out there with your signs and marching in front. So Michigan would come often. Michigan would have groups of people, which is amazing because women in those days didn't drive. And that was another thing. They would take you know, a train or something to get there. But there was a group of women who actually got in a car caravan and went across the United States in a car, and they drove. And that was amazing because they'd stop at towns and they would speak, and they thought, you women drove here in a car? That was amazing. For that time, it was. Uh, if you think about it, a lot of our... You know, people, women, my grandmother never, neither of my grandmothers learned how to drive. It wasn't ladylike. Like, when, that, when I first got a car, they were, were shocked. Like, how can you just drive places by yourself? I said, I just get in and I just drive. It's, it's a new world out there. And I realized that it was a new world for them. But, um, you know, if you think about it, right, it wasn't just, that wasn't ladies. Just so, on farms, they could do that. They could drive the tractors. That's on the farm. But they didn't get in the car and go to town then. And they knew how to drive. Um, women are really good at posters, too. I, they put out all kinds of posters. This is one of them. Seeing is believing. They, they had 1869, just one state, Wyoming. And then by 1909, they have four states. And then by 1918, they're really getting close at that time. They really are working really hard. Um, by 1918, they show that why, this is the one they used to get the final push for, for the right to vote. Michigan has come in, as you see. So Michigan actually passed the right to vote before the national suffrage because they really did a great job working on that. Um, one thing they did is they appealed to farmers, that the farmers realized that they can't work on the farm without women's help. I mean, on a farm, women are just about equal with men. Usually they're out there doing all the chores. So they really ap appealed to them. And women were really big in granges. As I had said, the, right, the, the way that women got the right to vote in Michigan was through the women's clubs and the Grange movement to help. Now, another woman I want to tell you about is Lucinda, or Lucia, Lucia Voorhees Grimes of Detroit. Um, she really, really helped Alice Paul get that final push. She had worked here really hard to get the vote here for people to finally pass the right to vote in Michigan by having a card system. You know, we don't have computers. So she had little index cards, and she'd write every name of every senator and every uh, legislator on a card, and she'd say whether they voted yes or no in the past on women's suffrage issues, whenever those bills came up, how their, you know, their beliefs were. They went and interviewed them and talked with them, and they had a little card system, and they would know where the pressure was. And they called it the pressure system. They would look at the cards like, this guy looks like he might Teeter. He might, there were some people that said, well, my mom is really pressuring me to vote for women's rights to vote. Like, okay, put the pressure on this guy. Uh, and so Alice Paul in D.C. actually asked Lucia Grimes to come from Detroit to D.C. and work on her campaign at the U.S. Congress. And she wrote a little card system up. Amazing. And she took her five-year-old daughter with her and did all this. Um, this woman's really amazing. I think Lucia Grimes 
is just an outstanding kind of type of woman from that new era of the 1900s that she went to D.C. I mean, what woman just gets up, packs up with her five-year-old daughter? Not today you would. And then, 1900s, to go uh, in the early days, it, by I think this was when she went, was, you know, 1916. She went to D.C. by herself with her daughter and worked on the party, in the Women's Party, worked in their, they had an office there, Women's Party office, and worked on this Congress, went to lobby, and they, they were, by that time, they were being attacked by different anti-groups, and they were pushed downstairs, and there, were, there was a lot. They were getting arrested. The government had the women in D.C. arrested, sent to prisons. They had these special women prisons. They put them up, and they would um, you know, just make them, it was a really horrible system. And they, they said, well, we have to let people know about this. Let them know that we're getting arrested and that we're getting beaten up and we're getting pushed on stairs at the at the Capitol, and and make people kind of turn their thoughts like, wait a minute, why are you doing this? Maybe they should have the right to vote. So it kind of turned. The more they they put pressure on people to think about what's happening and how like why is this such a scary thing? We just want the right to vote. People like Grimes and other people who really dedicated their lives, like Olympia Brown, just to working on suffrage. Olympia Brown got arrested, and she was uh, like in her 80s. Um, and she's, she's one of the people, they did a movie that had old um, clips of the women that were marching the suffrage parades in D.C., and they had clips of, uh, of all these women doing activities, getting picketing and burning the speeches of Wilson. And they actually had an interview before she died of Alice Paul. They had, had her interview about her days and how hard it was to do that, how um, she had gone on a hunger strike and they had force fed her in prison and how hard she worked for this right to vote. Like she said, women have to step up now and be civilly disobedient or not going to get anywhere. So she really made a difference, her and Lucia Grimes, who was very active too in, in her um, campaign. And the women's, they actually had their own women's party. It was eventually, you know, they dissolved that because they realized that you know, having a, a third party wasn't going to be productive. But it did put a lot of pressure because it, it took votes away from Republicans and Democrats. So they were scared. They wanted the women to stop. Um, so they had good tactics. Uh, when Lucia, after the right to vote, uh, she came back to Detroit and she taught at Cass Tech High School for many years. And she actually worked in her family business. It was the... Uh, Grimes Molding Manufacturing Company, and she was the vice president, and she was a purchasing agent. And that was interesting, too, because women in that time period, in the early 1900s, they didn't usually work outside the home. So she taught. She was in her company business. Uh, at 100 years, when she turned 100, U of M uh, gave her the Outstanding Achievement Award for being a teacher, a business executive, and a woman's rights advocate. So I thought that was quite nice that she got recognized finally, and we put her in the Women's Hall of Fame. And then we had a woman who I have to mention because she's from Battle Creek, uh, Edith Vosberg Alvord. And if, I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Um, she was raised in Battle Creek, and she went to Olivet College in... Um, in 1895. And then she uh, married Dr. Alvord and she went to Detroit, moved to Detroit. So, But she was here and she was from Battle Creek in, her, in the beginning. And when she got to Detroit, she decided that what she needed is to follow the example of what the women were doing, like the women's clubs. And she decided that's what they needed to do in, um, in Detroit. Because she was African American, she decided they needed to have their own because, you know, there was still segregation going on. So she started the African American group of women's clubs. And she started the 20th Century Club. And that became, in 1913, that became a huge group of women that could put pressure politically on different areas. And they worked for the right to vote, too. Um, they eventually, she eventually became president of the Detroit Federation of Women's Club, the whole federation. She moved into that. Um, and tirelessly worked for women's suffrage. And because of their work on getting elected, uh, because they could w run for school board, she finally w wound up being the first elected uh, woman in Highland Park School Board in 1918. Um, so she was a tireless advocate, and people remember her as a person that really worked for the betterment since she got in the school board uh, for the schools. She like tirelessly worked for school board and set up one of the first dental clinics in the school. And 
was a very outspoken woman in that area. So it took, like, women had to realize that they can organize. I think that's one thing that they, for this campaign, they realized that by organizing and being together in groups, they could do a lot. And I think before, because women are, you know, in their homes, they were divided, they didn't come together enough. I think, like, um, like Alvord, she realized that the more you get women together to talk and to get active, they could do a lot of things politically. So we see that, I think one of the things also that helped is like 1917 prohibition um, passed anyway without the women. They couldn't vote. Men voted for it. So it's like, okay, well, that kind of dispelled that. It's already happened. So the liquor appeal, you know, went away, that, that the, they stopped opposing it. And so by, you know, 1918, it passed by 35,000 votes. So Michigan was really taking the lead out there, as you saw on the chart. We were now one of those states that could say we had the right to vote. When the National Suffrage Association finally got through Congress and got the 19th Amendment passed through, um, Michigan was one of the first states, the first three states to ratify the very next day. They ratified it. It was Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois. So the Midwest was up there, right? And so it had to go through, you know, three, four states, and it was a long haul. It, it wasn't easy. We thought, oh, yeah, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, ratify it right away. The other states, not so much. They, they battled it out. They really were tight. Like Tennessee was the last one to go, and that's because a guy changed his vote at the end. He was a one-vote holdout, and his mom sent him a letter telling him to do it. He did it. <laughs> so good for moms, right? Um, and Tennessee was, got it over the edge, and it got three-fourths. And some states, I would hear this later, like people from Mississippi would tell me, and other states in the South, they would say, you know, we never officially ratified that. We had to let them vote because it's a federal thing. But we never officially ratified that. It's not in our books. Because they would always say that they, didn't really, they still didn't really like women voting. Not that women, not that women got out there and voted right away either. It, we found that, and Alice Paul said that, okay, we got the right to vote, now what? August 26, 1920, is called Women's Equality Day, and that's the, right, the, the day we got the right to vote, and that's the day that we, a lot of organizations sometimes will have a little um, celebration of that day to remind us that women still need to pay attention to what's going on. Because just because they had the right to vote didn't mean they used it. So Alice Paul said, we need to do something else. They dissolved the, uh, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and they formed a new group called the League of Women Voters, and you've heard of them, right? So Alice Paul was behind that formation. And there were a lot of women that decided, we've been organized, we've been political sized, we've met in these little women's clubs, now we're going to move into the League of Women Voters. And they became uh, very active and political. Now, you know, League, the League doesn't really take sides, it, it just educates. So that was the thing they said, we don't need to be Republicans, we don't need to be Democrats, we just need to educate women on, you know, think about this. So you can make an intellectual, intelligent decision, and that was their, their whole position. Think through, what are they voting for, where do they stand? Think about that card system that she developed, that, you know, the, that Grimes developed, that she had those little voter cards. That's kind of the thing that they, they took on and they would keep track. You know, a lot of groups did that for a long time time, before we had even computers, we would have to rely on somebody sending us a, a sheet that told us, where are your senators, where are your legislators, what are their views? Because a lot of people, it is hard to know, where, what are they voting on? But we finally did. Like, as the flyer said, women have changed. It's a new era. Women are no longer second-class citizens in some respects in the fact that they are going to school now. Remember when we first started out here working on the right to, for women to vote, women didn't go to college. They, could, they were lucky to go to past eighth grade. Most schools, um, when you got to eighth grade in the, the country schools, the one-room schoolhouses, especially in Michigan, almost everybody went to school to eighth grade, but hardly any women went beyond that because it was time to get married and do whatever you're going to do. Um, and then college was even less. Uh, women were considered, I remember even in my day, which isn't that long, and it's long ago, but not that long ago, that was the MRS degree is what women were getting. Remember that? So, like, women today go, what's that? I go, think about it. MRS, Mrs. You're going there to find a man to take care of you because you're not going to be able to take care of yourself. We still had that image that we couldn't do that. So I think that by having, like, women in the Women's Hall of Fame, having a, this 
a great database for one thing. You can go on the Women's Hall of Fame, click on that, and you can go and look up all these women that we've inducted. About 10 a year get inducted since I think we started the hall. I was part of that group that started the museum. It was in the early 80s. Uh, I think it was 84, that we started the actual the house that was the museum. Now they've no longer, they've melded this museum into the Women's Foundation. So there isn't a museum anymore. But they still have a great database and they're still keeping the Women's Foundation so they'd always have our induction. They would still keep the Women's Hall of Fame alive. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. Even though there isn't a physical museum, I'm glad you have a physical museum here because I think they're so great. I think little museums are important. If you, you can come and maybe you should have a little suffrage room eventually and have some of these great women. And oh, Mary Doe, I don't think I men mentioned, uh, well, it wasn't Mary, I, I forgot to mention that, you know, it was in Battle Creek that women first voted, a woman voted. Well, they don't count Sojourner of Truth. They said, well, she came to vote, and they kind of turned her way, and she just made a big big issue, and she wanted them to arrest her so it would get in the papers and it would be a big thing, and they just kind of wouldn't let her. But there was a woman who did vote, um, and there, was, there were two women that voted in Detroit. And I'm looking up the name of the woman. Um, Mary Wilson, I think it was, it was Mary Wilson voted. Actually, they let her vote. She, she said, well, I'm not married, and my husband can't, so I don't have a husband, so let me vote. And they did. They let her vote. And it was counted, and then my ancestor, Catherine Fish Stebbins, and um, Nanette Gardner voted in Detroit. And they, of course, arrested them. They let them vote because then they could arrest them. That's what they wanted because Susan B. Anthony did that in Rochester. And then they got arrested, they went to trial, and they made a big deal of it. So women sometimes do that just to get, you know, they start things going, just to have people, in, you know, they can educate people that way. Like, why are we being arrested for voting? And they talk about being taxpayers. And uh, it was in the free press, and they have a lot of articles about that. But so, but there was, you know, a vote cast in Battle Creek. So Detroit and Battle Creek are the big, that's kind of interesting. So if you ever have a little museum, you, you have a lot of history here. A lot of women who are very organized, a lot of uh, club movements, and then the Kalamazoo and this whole area, all this, all these women that came from this area, I think that's great that we were such a progressive state and that we can really be proud that we can still keep working on issues too. And the issue that Alice Paul said is the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, is what they need to do next because they didn't have economic equality. You might have political equality, but economic equality is still lacking. So that's the next thing, I guess, to work on for a lot of women. I don't know, they've worked on that a long time, but maybe eventually, like the women in the right to vote, they, a lot of women said, you know, failure is an impossible, that, like Susan B. Anthony said, a lot of people kept quoting her, failure is impossible, if you keep working, don't give up, eventually, I mean, she died, she never got the right to vote, Surgeon of Truth passed on, they didn't get to vote, even though she tried, um, and my ancestor voted, but got arrested, but still, eventually, they would see that the, the next generation would push that through, people like Alice Paul, and a little bit more little feistier woman that would get out there. I mean, that, not that these first women weren't, it was that social time was just more repressed, and then women got more out there. By the 1920s, you know, women were getting, there was the flapper generation, women were getting more out there and more assertive, and it was, I don't think it's ever gone back. I think women are doing a great job, and now look at all the elected officials we have, and we got women running for president, we got women doing all kinds of things, so we'll see. That'll be the next step, right? <laughs> so, okay, well, thank you. That is my, my talk about the women's suffrage movement. And I don't know if you have any questions or anything you want to, I have time for questions if you want. Well, I was just going to say something. Um, a children's book, um, picture book, it's called Around America to Win the Vote, Two Suffragists, A Kitten and 10,000 Miles. <laughs> and I checked it out and you know, because I'd never heard about women getting in a car and traveling. The, ca the car ca caravan? Right, no. yeah. And it was like, and I think it's great because it's a children's well, yeah, and people really say, uh-oh, uh, look at yeah, that. I'd never known about it until I picked it up, and you mentioned it. So it's hopefully mm -hmm. putting that into our educational system. So and talking about it. And talking about it. And that's one of the problems in our schools. I was asked once to come, because I'm a woman historian, I was asked to come to a, a it was a teacher conference. And, and member Michigan quality or, or education association, um, MEA. So I came to talk to MEA and, and um, I was supposed to talk about the MEEP scores and 
what things teachers needed to teach for the MEEPS when they had the MEEPS, the state standardized tests. And I looked at the, I thought, well, what questions do they ask about women? Not one. There wasn't one question on there. So I thought, well, what am I going to talk about? Well, that's what I talked about. I talked about all the women that should be in history books. Like, what, what are you not teaching? Why aren't you teaching this? And why don't you do the, like the car caravan? Why aren't you talking about this? Why, why do little girls not think that they can do things? Uh, and boys, too, because we have to know that you know, boys and girls together can do things. You know, that they have to work together. So we need to work on that. So that, that's one of the things about education. Books have been rewritten, but they always are hesitant. They don't like to revise history. It's really hard. But we've made them make some changes in some of the history books, that they add a few more women. But I remember when I'm teaching, uh, well, I was teaching, I'm retired now, but when I was teaching American history, well, some of the students, the men, would say, you know, you talk about women an awful lot. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned them more than twice in the class. <laughs> but we always talk about the men, right? Yeah. Nobody it's like, says, why are you talking about women? Because like, women did things. <laughs> like, why is that important? So, you know, they were already by college taught that, why are we talking about women? You know, that's like, you know, like, we don't need to do that. Like, what, well, are there any women presidents? Well, no, but we're working on it, working on it. So I think, because you usually teach uh, history very badly. And I asked why, why are high schools teaching, because they come into college and they'd hate history. Like, why do people hate history? Like, there's one or two, like, nerdy history people. That'd be all you get, and the rest of them would hate it. And I got, well, it was always taught so bad. And I thought, well, why? And I finally realized, because I remember when I was in college, they told me, not you can't go into history. You're a woman. I go, why is that? Well, you can never teach in a high school. And I remember asking why. And they said, well, we have to give the coaches something to teach. <laughs> I thought, is that kind of like saying coaches aren't smart? I mean, that's kind of bad. That's insulting all the coaches. Like, well, they can't teach math or physics. Like, why not? I mean, it's like, that was really awful that they, they let, think about it though, didn't your coaches in the old days, they taught, yep, they still teach history, right? Like, why is that? Because we got to give them something to do. And it doesn't matter if they, because you don't have to have a degree in history to teach it. It's just like boring. So, and all you do is talk about war to war to war. And I would all, I think, war to war to war. What about in between? What's happening then? Well, nothing went on. Yeah. So that was the new social historians who took on what was happening between the wars. And a lot of high schools never got past World War I or two. You know, like, well, you ran out of time. Well, because you're talking about the game, right? <laughs> you had a question? I just had a comment speaking of uh, rewriting history, but the new photo of the black hole that was taken and the yeah. algorithm was written by a young woman and social media instantaneously tried to rewrite it that her colleague yep. was actually the one who wrote the algorithm and because her colleague that they were trying to give credit to was gay and nobody knew that, he went out on social media and said that I am also a minority in this profession and um, corrected the attempt to rewrite the fact that a female wrote the algorithm that eventually led to the photo. Yeah, that great photograph. And that's how history got kind of perverted all the years because there was no, not, no social media. There was no one to say, wait a minute, you didn't get a voice. So all the history books got written by men and they, nobody could say, wait a minute, and what about the, the women from NASA, the movie that came out, the, was the Hidden Figures and all the, those are great, and I, I didn't know about that. I'm an historian, I didn't know about that. It's like, where are those, if you don't know how to dig that stuff up or do research or happen to fall upon it, but today, we, we have social media, we have the internet, we have ways of people bringing things out. Like, we've been working on equality so long, and now, we, you know, it, it happens, like you hear about things all the time. And women, it's going to be harder to, yeah, a little harder to write women out of the picture anymore. I think it's good because women are scientists. Women, but if you don't see someone doing that, you can't be that. It's really hard. I was a Girl Scout leader for a long time, and I remember that uh, slogan, like, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And we try to take our girls to all the NASA events and all that. We took them everywhere to see things that they could do. Not that they didn't want to do that, that's fine, but it's just options. And if they wanted to be a homemaker, that's a good option too, if you can do that. But you have to know your options. And I think that's the thing that you didn't have options. You just said, this is what you're going to be. And I go, okay. 
teacher and nurse. I don't like, I don't want to be a nurse. And okay. so I became a teacher. <laughs> and they said, yeah, you can't be, I want to teach history. No, you can't do that. Okay, political science. Well, that's even worse because you can't go on to law school because you're a woman. Because those are the days they could actually say that. You're a girl. You can't do that. And, you know. Didn't they have um, like secretary school, but it was like, it was something else, like how to be a proper there's a name for it. It was one of my yeah, like etiquette secretary type of schools. I remember a friend of mine went to one they, of the schools. In they Boston. had schools just for secretary, which are all women. There was Cleary College started that way in Ypsilanti as a woman secretarial school. My my aunt went there to learn secretarial skills mm -hmm. because that's what, if you look at um, just an offset. But if you look at the Census Bureau reports for years, that's one thing I got into is looking at what occupations and what were the top occupations for women and it used to be like servant servant household domestic servant and yeah it's like that was top number one and then you had a few but it was all manual things like really things like laundress <laughs> and then you started getting closer to the 1900s and I thought, oh it's going to get better well then sec then typewriters get evolved so typists and they actually called them a typewriter well that's a typewriter over there that's like i think it's a person they used to call them typewriters before they called that. That's just a typewriter. That they meant the the thing, and they didn't see the person doing it. Um, they the, so typists became one, but actually still, servants was still up there. I thought, wow. And then today, I said, what do you think top one in today? Secretary. It's still secretary. It's the top for women. And then you look at men, and men's top ones are all high paying, high paying. But women's are all low paying. And then the women who make it, they're still, I mean, they're so far down, they're not up in the top 10 at all. So there are women that you can see now. There are a few CEOs, there are a few everything, but they're just still making it. So I'm hoping the next generation, it gets more equality. But it, and it doesn't mean we have to push out men. We just have to kind of play, make the playing field a little evener. Michigan State was the first uh, medical school in the country to accept a female into their school. And was also the first woman graduated um, from Michigan State in the country. Michigan has always been the lead. If you get, we have a book that we had called First and Founders that was written by two Michigan women, and it was published by the Women's Hall of Fame, and I think they still have it there. They do have a little office, uh, a public building that you can come and see exhibits at, in Lansing. It's not the hall anymore, but the, or the house anymore, but there is like a center. And they, they may have that book there, but the book First and Founders had all these women that were first at that, and all the Michigan women, and it was just a huge book full. The first this and the first that, and you know, first women entrepreneurs, um, first, you know, like uh, Kellogg, Mrs. Kellogg. They always think of the doctors, but they, think, they forget that the wife did so much. And she was a nutritionist, and she was the person like, wow, forget that she's the one that really made it, the cornflakes famous. So we forget that the women are sort of in the background, but they do so much. And we had a lot of the first women to do like uh, vaccines and the first women doctors and the first women uh, in, in Michigan. So we've always been a leader. Marjorie Post is one of the first CEOs, I guess you call it. Yeah, we have she so many. Uh, for Michigan. Wasn't allowed to function, though. Yeah, they, they, we can make it, but we still, you know you're not equal. You're not equal. You have to really work really hard, and then if you do, you're called really an obnoxious woman, you know, because you're working like the men, and it's like, no, you, you're supposed to be still polite and take a back seat. Because, yeah, we, you yeah, know, it's very difficult. on a board meeting, but not be the president of the mm -hmm. board. They still had those women rules, and I think what, it's really hard. And Belle Isle, um, because of a woman, Leggett, um, she was the one that started Belle Isle Museum, and, or the state park. And I love the little museum and the stuff on state, and the state park now at Belle Isle, but it was her that said, we need that. And uh, women are the ones that said, we need playgrounds, we need... You know,